if we can change the first slide. Uh, the agenda for today is that I will give a short introduction to what the free network is to our new friends. And I will also give you a very brief introduction to the speakers and, and they can add a little bit of detail to their own CVs as they, they come online. Uh, but as we have said in the introduction and in, in the invitation, I mean, we will be discussing how the corona health situation looks in the region and we will then focus i think more importantly on what have been the policy responses in different country to the covid19 crisis um, i have also asked the panelists to share a bit more personal reflections on on why they think the response looks like it it's doing in different countries and, and maybe add a little bit of local flavor that we cannot read about in the FT or The Economist or other such uh, publications. Uh, and then, of course, we will have this discussion and Q&A session at the end. So please uh, be patient. You will have your chances as ask, at asking questions at, at the end of the presentations. Uh, but as I said, type the questions in and we'll, we'll do it from there. So the free network for, for the new friends of, of the network, um, it's a collaborative effort by a number of research and education institutions around the Baltics, Eastern Europe, in the Caucasus. Um, I'm the director of the Stockholm Institute of Transition Economics. My name is Torbjörn Becker. I've been here since 2006, um, and I'm, I'm a, your old school uh, international macro economist, but looking at, at the region in, in general. Um, we then have, if I go down the list as it's written here, the speakers are going to talk about their respective countries. And we have Jesper Reune, who is a professor here at SITE uh, in, in Stockholm, the Stockholm School of Economics. Uh, and we then have Sergei Gubins, who is a research fellow at uh, biceps in Latvia. We have Natalia Wolfkova, who is the director of the Center for Economic and Financial Research at NES. Uh, we have Yaroslava Babush, uh, lead economist at ISETS Policy Institute in Georgia. Uh, we have Timofey Milovanov, president um, of the Kiev School of Economics in Ukraine. Lev Levovsky, who is a senior research fellow at Berok in Minsk in Belarus. And we have Michal Myk, who is the director um, of Senea in Poland. So this will be your speakers today. I will be giving you a short introduction and I will then moderate the Q&A. But for the local content, the other speakers will be providing you those inputs. All right. So. Let's start to understand what the policy response is. I think it's useful to have some of the health statistics that we are being fed by our local media and international media on a daily basis. So I'll, I'll just give you these numbers in a few minutes here. So if we start uh, with what, what people were labeling as the East-West divide, uh, a month or so ago. So if you see in, in, in the panel with 25th of April, these are the number of cases in different countries uh, across Europe. Um, and we can see this much lighter shades in, in Eastern Europe and, and Baltics compared to Western Europe, including Sweden, which had much, much, um, darker colors, which indicates uh, many more cases of, of COVID-19 uh, in that part of Europe. If we fast forward to May 25th, we can see that there has been a significant increase of cases in countries like Russia and Belarus, but still there is a bit of this east-west divide. And we want to address this a little bit in, in the following uh, discussions. more detailed look at how the total confirmed COVID-19 cases look per million people, 
um, we can see that Belarus is now at the top of this list, uh, has even surpassed Sweden that for a long time has been looking like one of the more severely affected countries in the free network. Uh, we have also Russia that is quite up, high up on this list. But then we see for Poland, Latvia, Ukraine and Georgia, there is certainly still this sense of, of East and West divide. Uh, and then, of course, we have the, the confirmed uh, deaths per million people, where Sweden is definitely a, a very sad outlier. Uh, and, and with death rates that are way above what we have seen being reported in, in all of the other countries in, in the free network here. But this, of course, then leads us to, to the question of how well uh, is this reflecting the actual situation? Or what are the issues that we can think about when it comes to, to reporting or under-reporting measuring, testing, etc. Uh, in our different countries. So if, if we compare uh, the total confirmed cases of, of COVID-19 with deaths per million, as we do uh, in this chart, um, the scale is a little bit particular. Some of you will recognize this scale, but just focus on, on the table if you're not familiar with this type of a scale. But we can see that Sweden really stands out here. So for the total confirmed cases of COVID-19, that's about 33,000 in Sweden, but we have about 4,000 people who died of the disease. Uh, so total deaths per 100 cases is almost 12 in Sweden, whereas in Belarus, we have 0 0.55. So I mean, this puts some serious question in terms of do we have way many more cases in a country like Sweden that we simply don't know about because we're not testing? Or is a country like Belarus not actually finding the people that have the disease and are dying of the disease? So this is why their death rate is, is so low. So there are some quite, quite uh, complicated, I think, measurement issues that are involved when we're doing uh, a comparison like this. And, and there are certainly a lot of people that say that we should not compare data across countries when it comes to the confirmed cases and, and death rates because the statistics is, is so complicated and, and generated in, in so many different ways in these countries that it's not really uh, comparable. Um, all right, I will quickly just give you the health snapshot because I think what we see here, if we move to the next picture, is that Sweden which has a lot of deaths from COVID, is of course spending a lot of money on healthcare. So it, it's hard to believe that this comes from the fact that Sweden is not spending enough money on, on healthcare. This, this clearly is not uh, the explanation here. If we move on here, uh, we can see that, well, uh, also as a share of GDP, Sweden is an outlier here, and unfortunately not showing a positive or some, some positive impact of, of spending a lot of money and, and avoiding deaths in, in COVID. And of course, this is because this is a new disease and we, we're not prepared to handle it to some extent, but it, it's clear that this is not enough to, to sort of use as a model of, of why this is so different across this region. Finally, where, where Sweden is not standing out in this way is with hospital beds per 1,000 people, since a lot of the Swedish healthcare system is not focusing on keeping people in hospitals, uh, which is maybe a factor also now when we're preparing for, for intensive uh, care use and ventilators, etc. But again, I, I, I don't think any of these straight up regular health measures correlate particularly well with, with the developments we see in terms of COVID deaths and, and spread in the region. So that's why we wanna look a little bit more in detail and get the local flavor. What may actually explain the differences in, in our respective countries? What have governments tried to do to both uh, stop sort of the spread of the disease 
and also to keep the economies going at the same time. So we will now be giving you the, the local pictures and we'll, we'll go back to the, the free network map and we're going to start here in Stockholm. We'll then move across the Baltics to Latvia uh, moving in, if we can go back to the, the previous slide for one second, we'll move into from Latvia to Russia. We'll go down to, to Georgia, uh, coming back up uh, through Ukraine, uh, Belarus and, and Poland uh, before we start the Q&A session. All right, so with this, I'm going to leave uh, the floor, I guess the screen, to my colleague Jesper Reine. Uh, here at site. Please, Jesper. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks a lot, Tobian. Uh, I'll try to be uh, brief uh, in terms of introducing what's what's happening in Sweden. So um, Sweden certainly attracted a lot of the uh, international attention um, in many media introduced or portrayed as the country where everything is business as usual. Uh, that's not quite true. I'll get back to that a little bit. Uh, but what remains true is that most restrictions in, in Sweden have been in the form of, of recommendations and very little has actually been in, in terms of enforced rules and regulations. Um, there's one more thing that seems to intrigue a lot of the international commentary around the case of Sweden and, and that's the what, what looks as if the government is totally invisible in, in this uh, and instead it's the public health agency of Sweden that's holding press conferences and deciding uh, things. This is in fact the, according to, to Swedish constitutional rules, even the, the default situation. Um, so in terms of responsibility, it's the public health agency of Sweden that runs the day-to-day -day actions in, in this kind of crisis. However, um, and, and a lot of people have pointed to that ministerial rule, for example, is, is expressly, explicitly forbidden in Sweden. This, however, should not be taken as that the government's hands are tied in, in terms of this. The government has ample possibilities to step in if they want to. But in terms of what the default is, it's true that there is a constitutional peculiarity in, in Sweden vis-a-vis -vis a number of other countries. But we can, we can discuss that more if, if anyone wants to come back to that. Um, in terms of how the disease has developed in Sweden, it's, um, the, the first cases started to pop up in, in February, a few scattered cases, but it's not until really the first week of March when a larger number of cases become apparent. And it's very clear that these all come from uh, people returning from winter holidays from mainly Northern Italy and Austria. Um, so in the first week of March, uh, almost all cases are of this nature. It's people who have been abroad and come back. So the Public Health Agency of Sweden holds its first press conference on March 6. And at this point, the idea is still to sort of try to track down and trace people who come from abroad. Um, this, however, very quickly becomes uh, obvious that this is not working or going to work because they start finding cases outside of this population. So by March 12, March 11th, um, they announce what since then has been the Swedish, um, Swedish strategy, if we want to call it that, or the overall policy. Um, and even though they haven't been explicit uh, about this, I think it's very clear that there are two things which they've tried to do or which form sort of the core goals of, of this strategy. And that's to mitigate the spread, not to su suppress it, to mitigate the spread of the disease and to protect the elderly, most vulnerable uh, part of the population. Policy actions or rather recommendations taken, some policy actions also. So gatherings of more than 500 were forbidden on March 11th. 
that was changed down to 50 a couple of weeks later. Um, on March 17th, there's recommendations about closing universities and, and schools for uh, children above the age of 15, but other schools and daycares remain open. So the reason why I said initially that this does not mean that business has been as usual um, can be illustrated by the graph here on the side, which is uh, one of the a, a number of possible mobility reports i just chose this this is from transit stations in the nordic countries um, so bus stops subways etc um, but I, I would say that this is representative for workplaces and the uh, other places as well in terms of how mobility changes so the yellow line there is is Sweden and the three others are Denmark, Finland, Norway that took much more serious steps uh, to, to close down uh, mobility. So clearly it's not business as usual in Sweden, but also equally clearly there's a big difference between Sweden and the other Nordic countries in, in this sense. Um, so in terms of the overall policy then, uh, let's change to the next slide. Um, there are many ways of, of looking at this, but there are two key dimensions, I think, behind the aggregate death numbers so far. And one is that there's a massive failure in protecting the elderly. Mitigation has worked well in the sense that um, the healthcare system has been strained, of course, but not totally overrun. Uh, but in terms of protecting the elderly, that has not worked out. So, uh, given what Turbjörn already mentioned about the problems with data, and especially in Sweden because of the lack of testing here, what I use in these graphs is excess death. Um, so excess death is death this year in relation to the average number of deaths different weeks uh, in the years 2015 to 2019. So the dashed lines here are the average in the sort of normal year. And to the left, we see different age groups. And there we see that there is some down the blue line and the purple line in the bottom. That's the number of deaths in the population in the age group zero to 64. So we do see a small increase, but this is counted in numbers of tens, uh, maybe 100, but not more. While it's, it's the other age groups from 65 and up where we see most of the death. The graph to the right is the ratio of deaths in different regions to the average number in 2015, 2019. And so here, the, the darkest purple is Stockholm County. That's, it's very regionally centered in Stockholm. Uh, the green is the rest of the country excluding Stockholm and the red is where we see almost no excess death is Skåne which is the south of the country where the third largest city Malmö is, is located and the blue one is, is Gothenburg region. Um, however it should be said that Gothenburg looks as if it's somewhat increasing now. Okay so moving on to the, to the next slide. Um, in terms of economic policies, there's, of course, uh, a large number of things that could be detailed here, but broadly speaking, um, there's been a lot of programs to protect both firms and employees. Currently, estimates are looking at about 4% of GDP. Um, the largest portion of this is, uh, and that's in, in pure spending. So there's a lot of lot more money in terms of guarantees, for example, and, and possibilities to, to inject money in the financial system, et cetera. But in terms of unemployment, that's not up all that much. It's 8.1% in April this year, as compared to 67 last year. But the true impact is in, in terms of sh what's called short-term allowance. So there's a program which allows companies to basically send people home, um, but the government covers the, the wage bill. And that's costing order of magnitude 2% of GDP for, for this year. That's the estimate. 
And in general, the big reason for why Sweden has this possibility of maneuvering is that public debt stands at like 35% of GDP. That's way below Maastricht, uh, 60%. And so leaves plenty of fiscal room to, as they say, do anything it takes or everything it takes to, to protect jobs and, the, and firms. Um, briefly, just to round off the introduction of Sweden, uh, the key policy issues discussed right now is, of course, a lot about how we're dealing with the epidemic or rather not dealing with the epidemic. And here, a lot of people who've been critical of, of what the public health agencies doing um, are pointing now to the relative success of, of our Nordic neighbors. And, and this, of course, is, is a big topic. Um, the lack of testing, frankly, remains a mystery to <laughs> most people I talk to at least um, and on the economic side there's um, it's it, there's not a lot of disagreement around the domestic policies I mean most people say that we have a lot of room to to do whatever it takes in Sweden but there's currently some discussion about how to relate to to the EU packages in terms of of saving other countries and and what the EU should do so so that's briefly the, the Swedish situation. I'll pass Thanks, on. Jesper. Um, we will move directly over to Latvia and Sergei, and then we'll save the discussion of, of this to the end. Thank you. Hello from uh, Riga. Uh, my name is Sergei Gubin. I am a research fellow at the uh, Baltic International Center for Economic Policy Studies. Uh, let me uh, briefly guide you through a Latvian case. Um, Latvia is a relatively a small country of 1.9 million. Uh, in terms of size, it's uh, similar to Denmark or Austria. Um, so the uh, population density is relatively small. Uh, Latvia has the second lowest rate of mortality in the European Union, only 23, today 24 deaths in total and the sixth lowest rate of infection, uh, slightly above 1,000 infected person. And half of all the cases are in Riga. There is a small uh, map on the side, uh, basically represents population density. Uh, half of the population is, uh, lives in Riga or close to it. So that's where the infection is. And total number of tests is slightly above uh, 100,000. This is on par on average uh, level with the European Union. So the first case, uh, red, first registered case happened on the 3rd of March. And it's a rather curious uh, story because already on the 4th of March, that woman, uh, who uh, that lady who arrived uh, to Riga from Milan, was discharged from hospital. Uh, so it means that either she was at the very late stage of uh, illness or her initial test was false positive. We don't know, but it's interesting to me, I speculate here, but I think that case created certain tension in society, across policymakers and politicians, and that played as a mental trigger uh, for the government to start preparing for, for the eventuality of the COVID. And then indeed, uh, 8th of March, that's the first, uh, uh, the, the, another recorded case happened, and on the 9th March again. And so uh, the government uh, proclaimed emergency situation on 12th of March. Uh, at that time, there were only 10 registered cases. So, um, my impression uh, is that it was really uh, quick in action. It's slightly uh, um, after uh, the Estonians uh, who uh, received the COVID uh, uh, like a week before the situation around and then re responded uh, maybe slightly quicker because we were mentally prepared to do so. So, what are the key? Uh, 
key, key measures, uh, two meter distancing. Uh, all universities and schools were closed, ban on all public events, theaters, museums are closed, ban on meetings of more than 50 people immediately. What was uh, quite uh, surprising, uh, the ban on international public transport, no planes, buses, no ferry to Stockholm, for example, Riga Airport and Air Baltic were closed on 17th of March. So the government gave five days to those who are permanent residents of Latvia, but who are located abroad, to come back. Uh, um, that, that's, and then uh, they arranged the repatriation flights throughout the period. O overall, there were like 10, 20 flights in total. And so uh, there was also a two-week quarantine for everyone arriving from abroad. And later on, those measures were tightened. Mm, for example, there was announcement that only two people might meet. Uh, it was on, at the end of March. And, uh, two weeks ago, this uh, 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 restriction was changed to 25 uh, people who meet. And also, at the end of March, uh, suspension of planned medical services were announced. So, to give room uh, to treat uh, COVID patients, but also to avoid uh, potential infection within the uh, healthcare system. Importantly, offices, kindergartens, supermarkets, cafes, parks, hair salons, forests, beach, swamps, uh, remained open throughout the entire period, and they are still open. No internal travel restrictions, no compulsory masks in public transport until uh, mid-May. And uh, um, just uh, uh, two weeks ago, uh, Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania announced so-called Baltic travel bubble, or uh, Baltic Schengen area, if you will, so that people can travel from one country to another and come back uh, without uh, uh, needing to spend two weeks at home uh, as a quarantine. Um, right, can I have the next slide, please? The government has consolidated 4.5 billion to fight COVID crisis until 2023. Uh, in comparison, uh, that's uh, so Latvia's GDP is 30 billion and state budgets and 10 billion in regular years. So that's uh, basically 15% um, of uh, Latvia's GDP or 45% of the state budget. And this is uh, money uh, that the government uh, has uh, on hands in cash from international uh, institutions uh, via loans and also through the savings uh, in during previous years. So 1.5 billion uh, is meant to compensate for the drop in tax revenues. Uh, so so counter cycling uh, to have a counter cycling effect. Two billion for the allowances in infrastructure projects already now and one billion for from private investments. So that's what they say. I suspect that's gonna be subsidized loans. So the government will give money to private firms at the, uh, certain, and then they will pay back later on. But these are just plans. At the moment, uh, the spending uh, looks the following. Uh, 28 millions were spent for actually giving money to people who were affected, so workers and self-employed. Uh, tax holidays, 160 million. Loans and guarantees for firms, 230 million. So, not so much of actual spending as you see. The only big chunk of money going from changing hands, so to say, was from uh, was an equity investment to Air Baltic. Uh, it received a quarter of a billion to to survive. Uh, and then uh, 75 million were allocated for road infrastructure projects that will be uh, performed this year already, so that to boost the economy. The key policy issues discussed, um, probably the main is uh, that the funds, uh, the support is going very slow uh, to the firms and workers. Um, and the average idle allowance is only uh, is half of the average wage. So it's really not enough. Unfortunately, there are quite strict conditionalities to get support. So the firm should not have any tax debts uh, and uh, the firm should have at least 30% drop in turnover relative to the previous year, which is hard to meet. This criteria is hard to meet for, for young firms. 
Um, there is also um, a lack of additional support for the hospitality industry, transport, tourism. Unemployment rate, uh, uh, the very last latest features, uh, figures were 7.4% uh, as compared to 6% uh, at the end of uh, last year. And we project, or the Minister of Economics projects that uh, it will reach 11% uh, later this year. And the projected GDP drop is around 6 Nobody really knows, of course, uh, what the drop will be, but uh, that's a projection from the Bank of uh, Latvia. That's uh, in brief uh, all from Latvia. Thank you, Sergei. Very efficient, just like your government has been doing so far. We move straight over to Russia, and I welcome Natalia Volchkova to make her presentation about Russia. Please, Natalia. Hello from Moscow, dear colleagues. Um, I will briefly describe uh, the uh, epidemic and economic situation in Russia. Uh, Russia uh, followed, uh, I would say, standard European uh, procedure with um, uh, putting restrictions on mobility of people uh, quite early. So it was end of March when uh, schools, universities were, and kindergartens were uh, closed. Schools and universities moved to distant learning uh, protocol. And uh, the same, uh, at the same uh, time, restrictions on public gathering was uh, put down. Uh, events and uh, big events and all events were actually cancelled. And travel controls was put in place in, on March 30. It was uh, a bit, compared to uh, the way Europe proceeded, it was a bit earlier than uh, uh, it happened in Europe, so relative to epidemic situation. So uh, at the same time, there was uh, attempt to control uh, people who uh, came from abroad. It was not quite successful, uh, but still uh, there was attempt to do this. So uh, when this, um, uh, when the decision was reached to uh, introduce self-isolation regime, so it's not uh, like full uh, prohibition on uh, mobility of people, but it's still called self-isolation, uh, which uh, was more restrictive for older people, starting from 65 age and older. People in Moscow, first of all, were um, uh, in incentivized to stay at home. Uh, and this older population was, uh, the incentives was made in a form of one-time transfer, one, uh, small but reasonable um, monetary transfer uh, to older people. So uh, they were, uh, because, uh, because of their vulnerability to epidemics, they were of special concern uh, by the government. So uh, at the same time, uh, new hospitals starting um, constructed uh, in Moscow and in nearby. So there were two very big uh, hospitals specifically for uh, coronavirus patients uh, built uh, within a month. And uh, there was substantial emergency investment in health um, in form of both uh, payments to medical workers to, to uh, in, uh, extra money put on their uh, wage bill. And, uh, but most of money went to uh, building new facilities and uh, beds in Moscow and in Iran. So, uh, at the same time, the uh, substantial efforts were put to, uh, for te to testing, and up to now, uh, more around 10 million tests uh, for coronavirus were um, performed. Uh, now it's uh, more than 350, up to 400,000 uh, confirmed cases out of these millions of tests. Of course, there is uh, a lot of uh, false negative but uh, that's uh, the numbers. Uh, the uh, situation in Moscow today now is uh, on uh, in declining uh, in terms of number of um, cases of COVID patients, but in 
Moscow, how the uh, epidemic situation was spread across the country. It started in Moscow and then it's moved uh, slowly to regions. Uh, there was a, a number of uh, regions, uh, the restrictions on cross-regional mobility were introduced. So in order to prevent the uh, dissemination of the epidemic, but uh, of course it's never uh, perfect. So uh, the um, overall, uh, the current situation is that in Moscow, um, le around half of uh, um, hospital beds, uh, specifically uh, uh, which are uh, allocated for COVID patients are free. And uh, this week, uh, Moscow medical workers uh, were starting, uh, uh, they, they are sending to regions. So uh, there is uh, the process uh, how medical uh, resources of Moscow and Moscow region uh, can be used to help uh, people and the medical, medical station in uh, regions. Um, uh, in terms of uh, economic uh, measures, can you show next slide, please? Uh, so uh, the um, so far, the government come up with free uh, support packages. They are the uh, they are of the uh, approximately the same size. Uh, the money that was supposed to uh, be uh, to be spent within this in the framework of these packages but uh, it's just intentions it's not yet uh, all money uh, dispensed uh, from the budget it's roughly each package is roughly uh, one percent of gdp or ten percent of uh, sovereign fund um, the first package uh, was mostly uh, uh, mostly dealt with um, vulnerable groups of population and uh, the most uh, the uh, money mostly spent uh, transferred to families with children. The, uh, the way how uh, the government deal with uh, business, uh, to, uh, how deal with supporting business is uh, different from what we observe in Europe, what we see in Europe. And the reason for this is um, the lack of infrastructure, how to support unemployed people. So uh, the idea of government was uh, to, uh, to keep uh, labor force in place as long as possible. Uh, and uh, uh, the idea was to support firms, not unemployed people. The, re the reason for this is that beca because of very low uh, unemployment uh, over the last uh, 10, 15 years, uh, the official uh, and very low unemployed unemployment benefits in Russia uh, how they used to be uh, there is there is a reluctance of people to go for unemployment offices uh, to seek for the benefits uh, because of uh, substantial um, shadow sector that's where uh, people who lose lost jobs uh, usually go uh, this time, unfortunately, uh, for this system, uh, the, for this uh, technology, uh, the um, shadow sector was also the one that suffered because of uh, crisis. So uh, there was definitely a problem uh, how to uh, support these unemployed people. So the government tries for all these uh, packages, it tries to uh, tries to uh, in, 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 uh, put incentives for firms to keep people employed. So uh, this is why uh, there was first uh, the idea in the first package was assumed uh, the um, uh, zero interest rate credits to firms for uh, to pay uh, wages or wage uh, spending. It didn't really work well because banks of course are reluctant to uh, give or uh, provide this uh, credit, so it really didn't work. But there was also social tax decline for so small and medium enterprises for all irrespective of sector. Uh, actually, social tax uh, rate uh, declined twice. Uh, and um, there was bankruptcy moratorium and uh, tax and credit payment deferral. But uh, the people, people and uh, 
population and business was not happy with this uh, package. But the easiest way how they actually, and this is why we observe in all three packages that a government supports families with children because of the uh, existing system, how so-called the uh, mother capital, that is the, uh, the, the money that families with newborns receive, there is a uh, system how to, to distribute this money. So this is why it was used very heavily. So families with children of different age actually received uh, substantial support, uh, which, uh, which is um, quite reasonable because in uh, Russia, uh, the most vulnerable group of uh, people is families with children on average. So, uh, the, um, there was some discuss, discussion in, uh, in popular spaces uh, on uh, uh, universal transfer, but the, the, the thing is that uh, Russia is not like uh, the country which will benefit uh, from this measure in my view, because uh, roughly 40% of uh, employment in Russia is in budget-related uh, sectors. So, and these people, uh, they their income did not fall or fall very slightly because of some benefits and maybe loss of some benefits. And so uh, then, uh, 40 million of people—that is roughly 20% uh, of population—is pensioners. It's also uh, they also rely on uh, budget uh, money. They also they. There was no loss of income. So, uh, in the um, few um, good uh, surveys I saw uh, recently, uh, the result is that uh, roughly 50% of uh, labor force in Russia didn't uh, did not um, get a decline in income. Of course, there are there is a very vulnerable group who lost jobs and their income fall dramatically. And unfortunately, exist uh, despite the fact that uh, the uh, unemployment benefit increased uh, up to uh, substantially increased up to uh, minimum uh, wage uh, rate. Uh, very uh, few people uh, who applied to this uh, unemployment benefit actually receive it. That's the problem because the system doesn't work. Uh, it didn't work before and it doesn't work in this crisis time. So this is why the uh, in the last package uh, which was uh, of support which was introduced uh, two weeks ago, uh, there was um, uh, there was a credit uh, uh, offer for firms with uh, with uh, subsequent forgiveness of this loan if uh, they pres preserve employment in a year. So this, the idea is to, uh, uh, to uh, provide incentives to, for firms and support for firms who keep employment intact. So besides uh, government uh, packages, uh, federal government packages, there is a number of regional uh, support packages and central bank package uh, as well, which is uh, which deals with financial stability and uh, uh, provide better credit terms for small medium enterprises and regulatory and the supervisor burden is relaxed uh, on financial institutions. So overall, uh, there is um, up to now up to three uh, percent of GDP in federal government uh, package, which is intended to help the economy to go through crisis. And um, uh, just uh, when a summer, uh, summing up uh, the discussion, I want to just uh, I want to um, tell that uh, yesterday the, uh, the this new program of uh, testing started in Ru in Russia. Now it, uh, it's free testing. Now it is for antibodies, and the idea is it started in Moscow. And the idea is uh, to do uh, a lot of testing uh, to uh, support, uh, finance by state in order to uh, measure epidemiological situation as uh, much as possible. Thank you. Thank you, Natalia. We are going to move straight over to Yaroslava Babu, who will tell us about uh, the Georgian case. So, Yaroslava, please. Um, thank you very much, Turpjorn. Um, I represent uh, ICPI, uh, Policy Institute.
with our uh, free network colleagues, we have been following very closely uh, the COVID situation in Georgia and elsewhere. So uh, the first thing to say is that uh, Georgia has been recognized indeed as one of the rare success stories fighting COVID epidemic with very limited resources. Uh, so what what are the keys? Uh, what were the keys to uh, Georgia's success? The country of just uh, 3.7 million people that uh, to this to date has uh, 738 confirmed cases and only 12 deaths. So this is a pretty impressive record for um, for. Um, a small country with uh, indeed limited resources. So I would say uh, one of the keys was that um, uh, just like Latvia, Georgia moved uh, early to detect uh, the imported cases of COVID-19. Um, and um, um, when uh, the uh, epidemic broke out in the neighboring Iran, Georgia was already doing very proactively uh, border, uh, border temperature checks. And in fact, uh, flights from Iran were suspected a few days before the first uh, confirmed COVID case um, uh, arrived into Georgia. It was detected at the border, in fact. So, um, uh, so this was, uh, I mean, this, this vigilance, early vigilance paid off. Uh, and then um, as uh, the emergency situation was declared on March 21st, uh, there was a mandatory two-week quarantine for all Georgians and uh, uh, essentially for everyone um, who was arriving from abroad in government-provided facilities. So these people were not sent home. They were hosted in, um, uh, in designated hotels. And that gave uh, government uh, the opportunity to, uh, to control the situation, to make sure that the disease uh, does not spread um, uh, to uh, for, well from from potential uh, from potentially infected people, um, there were also local travel bans and um, hotspots uh, identified hotspots within the country. Um, so, um, in terms of um, in terms of rules and regulations, uh, the uh, the rules were quite strict uh, following the uh, March twenty first state of emergency declaration. Um, there were curfew. There was a curfew announcement. Public transport was closed. But in the same time, these rules were not overly strict. So they were not um, uh, they were not prohibitively strict for people. Uh, in a sense, if uh, public transport was um, uh, was not running, at least uh, uh, private vehicles movements were not prohibited. So people could still take a car. Uh, to a local pharmacy or to a, to a grocery store. Uh, but uh, in the same time, there were very steep fines for breaking these rules. Um, so if, um, um, if people were caught uh, playing soccer, let's say 10 people uh, together, that, uh, that meant that each of them had to pay around uh, 3,000 Georgian Larry fine, which is three times an average monthly salary. This is uh, this pretty, pretty much uh, uh, pre prevented, uh, the, prevented the um, uh, bad behavior and uh, people were not tempted uh, to break these rules. Um, so um, the true test of uh, Georgia's government efficacy in controlling the situation came around the time of Orthodox Easter on uh, April 19th. Um, so the government uh, decided not to ban Easter uh, services, uh, which was uh, indeed smart because um, the outright ban would probably not have been effective. Um, uh, and George, well, people would still go to churches uh, and it would be very deeply unpopular. So um, what happened is that um, uh, the movement of all vehicles, including private vehicles, were prohibited for two weeks around the time of Orthodox Easter. So if you wanted to go to church, you had to go on foot. Uh, and um, also uh, the curfews, uh, the, the curfew limits were, um, were still in place. So if you want to go, you had to go before 
9 p.m. and you have to stay um, until, until 6 a.m. Uh, also, these uh, social distancing rules of two meters uh, separation were strictly, um, strictly observed uh, in churches as well. So even after the, uh, the Orthodox uh, Easter services, um, uh, we didn't see the escalation of the outbreak. Uh, so this clear communication strategy, sensible rules, and strict enforcement actually worked together and resulted in something that <laughs> Georgian authorities uh, typically don't enjoy, uh, which is uh, 80 percent above 80 percent public trust in the information that was coming from authorities, um, information and advice coming from authorities. So this is pretty pretty big for Georgia, and um, this is based on the survey, um, consumer confidence survey. Uh, our institute um, has done in um, April, mid-April. Uh, so uh, next slide, please. Um, I will move on to key economic policies. So uh, government uh, key support, uh, key support um, mechanisms were directed towards uh, the strategic, um, uh, the strategic sectors, I would say. Uh, tourism sector, which is both uh, has um, a prominent plays a prominent role in Georgia's development plans, uh, and also it's um, it's one of the it's one of the fastest uh, growing sector. Now it accounts for around 11 percent of GDP. It was also very the hardest hit uh, initially. Um, so um, the uh, the early measures were in place to protect. The, and support the tourism sector. Among them, these measures were the uh, tax um, uh, abolishing property tax until the for 2020 for tourism related industries. Uh, also, um, deferral of income tax payments uh, for tourism related industries uh, or businesses, uh, and the, and a number of other uh, uh, support mechanisms uh, such as. Uh, um, a loan, uh, loan support, uh, interest payments and loan support for hotels, uh, so on and so forth. The second uh, sector which uh, received government attention was agriculture. It was not directly affected, but it still uh, accounts for 43% of uh, employment in the country. So this sector is only 7% of GDP, but um, a lot of, well, um, nearly half of um, employed um, people work there. So it's, um, it's pretty socially, socially it is very important sector. So there were recently an anti-crisis plan was announced for agriculture sector as well. Uh, as far as social, other social measures, there were two, uh, two largest private banks in Georgia announced a three months grace period on loan payments for individuals and micro businesses. And this loan um, grace period is likely to be extended. Uh, also, um, uh, one of the one of the um, weaknesses of the Georgian uh, system is that uh, there are no uh, automatic uh, automatic stabilizers. There are essentially no automatic stabilizers uh, in place for unemployed people. There is no unemployment insurance. Uh, plus, uh, about uh, 20 to 40 percent of GDP is uh, the gray economy. So there is no mechanism to effectively transfer money to people who uh, who lost their jobs. So there were various ways, uh, there were various uh, uh, measures um, that were introduced. So monthly cash payments were provided to those who have been contributing income tax and stopped uh, contributing in income tax around um, uh, around March. Uh, then there was a blanket support for utility payments for people below a certain threshold um, of payments. And of course, there were price uh, fixing mechanism for specific food products. So this is how this, um, uh, in essence, this mechanism worked. Um, so what about the key policy issues that are being discussed right now? Well, um, one of the first thing that Georgia, Georgia has an ambition to be one of the first countries in the world and the first country in the region to open its borders for international tourism. So from July 1st, in, um, international tourism uh, resumption is planned. 
and from June 15th, internal to Uh, so Georgia wants to um, promote itself as a safe destination, safe tourism destination globally, and it's already um, negotiating with country uh, green uh, green corridors and some um, some some other um, measures to ensure that the tourism uh, tour tourists come back from these uh, strategic countries. So this underscores the importance of this sector in Georgia's development plans. Um, and uh, last but not least, um, uh, well, no, the, the second point is, well, identifying the industries, other industries that could be supported. So this, um, um, this is in particular construction sector. So the government wants to avoid the meltdown of the construction sector, which happened in 2008, 2009. And now the sector is under stress because um, many of the uh, buyers of the property were foreigners. So um, in order to support the sector, some um, mortgage, uh, mortgage uh, loan support will be instituted and uh, other measures are being discussed. Um, right now within the government. So um, last is, um, well, really is a long-term, something, something long-term measures identifying Georgia's place in the new world, in the new post-COVID world. What are the growth opportunities for a country like Georgia in this changing landscape? Um, given that the value chains have been disrupted worldwide and there is orientation towards more localized, but in the same time, more diversified production for global businesses. Uh, uh, where, uh, where can Georgia contribute? What, uh, what niche can it fill in, in this new world? So these are these um, main key policy issues that are being discussed right now. So thank you for your attention. This is all from my side. Thank you, Yaroslava. So we go to Lev and he'll be talking about uh, Belarus. Lev. Hello everybody, thank you Torbjorn. Uh, my name is Lev Lvovsky and I am from Barak, uh, from Belarus. So Belarus is um, also, as Sweden, an interesting case um, in um, uh, this um, coronavirus uh, crisis. Uh, Belarus has roughly similar uh, similar population as Sweden. Uh, we were late starters um, in uh, this COVID uh, problem, um, and uh, in the and we never adopted any quarantine measures or closure measures. Uh, in the beginning, uh, we were like the rest of the world; our cases were doubling uh, every week. Uh, but something changed on April 29, and since April 29, uh, we went on some kind of plateau at 900, 950 ca new cases per day. Uh, now, we are now a uh, European leader in uh, confirmed cases per million population, uh, but uh, we have one of the lowest official uh, death tolls uh, in Europe. Our death toll is uh, stable at four, five, uh, sometimes six deaths per day uh, and uh, does not change over time. Uh, Overall, our healthcare system was somewhat well prepared uh, for uh, this uh, virus, for these uh, epidemics. Um, we have uh, many doctors and nurses per, uh, per 100,000 of population, uh, and we have this uh, intact uh, Soviet-style system of fighting pandemics. Uh, but we didn't follow uh, other countries' example in fighting this one. Uh, there is no official quarantine, no border closures, uh, public events are not pro prohibited, uh, only very few are. Uh, 
uh, there were religious holidays. We celebrate both Orthodox Easter and Catholic Easter. We have uh, soccer games. Uh, Belarus uh, uh, held victory parades um, and uh, other public gatherings. Uh, the, one of the few measures uh, in terms of health policies that we have is that uh, every person arriving to Belarus uh, must be must self isolate for two weeks, but uh, this is not really strictly enforced. So government expects from people to do it, but doesn't control this. Uh, official policy initially was to trace and isolate cases, uh, but it also did not prove itself to be very efficient. Uh, we don't have uh, publicly available commercial testing yet, and uh, government does not um, make random testing. So. Uh, we don't have a very good idea uh, about uh, how widespread this virus is in population. Can we go to the next slide? Um, as I said, uh, in terms of healthcare, we came rather well prepared to this crisis. But uh, in terms of uh, economy, we were not that well prepared. Uh, there were few government responses uh, to the crisis. Uh, Central Bank uh, moved fast and provided financial regulatory easing uh, to banks uh, and, um, um, and uh, decreased uh, interest rates. Uh, government uh, was moving rather slow. Uh, it delayed uh, some tax payments for businesses, uh, but not others. Uh, it decreased rent, but only for those who rent uh, uh, from the government. Uh, while, of course, uh, clearly many people rent from, uh, uh, from private business. Uh, Key policy issues that are being discussed, uh, I guess uh, the main one is uh, absence of a proper unemployment benefit. As uh, in many other countries in region, we don't have this very important automatic stabilizer. Well, technically we have it, there is an employment benefit, but uh, the maximum amount that you can receive is $22. Um, with the average salary around $500. So it's um, very small money. Uh, people, uh, people right now start to feel economic crisis. Unemployment uh, starts to grow, although it's not that big right now. And uh, there are some talks and talks from government about possibility to increase unemployment benefit, at least for a short term, and try to increase it to $100, uh, which is uh, minimal li uh, life cost. Uh, the problem is, however, is that the government does not have uh, enough uh, funds to provide uh, uh, population and businesses with support. Uh, therefore, government right now tries to obtain loans from international organizations um, and China uh, in order to finance the necessary economic programs. But meanwhile, uh, no success. Uh, we have some projections of uh, 2020 GDP. Uh, it is projected to fall by four to six percent, uh, but uh, there are uh, at least some signs that uh, we may go faster and fall lower. For example, in April, industrial production uh, already fell by seven percent uh, if compared to April of 2019. 
Um, we don't have very good data about the developments uh, of crisis uh, in Barrack, uh, which showed that about 48% of individuals already see decrease of their income. Although I should say that uh, this survey was not representative of the whole population, but uh, just for urban population. Um, overall, uh, uh, I should say that uh, uh, I don't know if uh, it was uh, exempt uh, a good decision, but exposed, we see that uh, Belarusian uh, response policy towards health crisis was not that bad. And even if uh, some deaths are underreported, uh, we should say that, uh, well, we are not in a big uh, healthcare crisis. Uh, but, uh, economic, uh, but economically, uh, I think we are on the verge of some bigger crisis. Thank you. Thank you, Lev. Uh, we will move straight over to Poland and we will then have Michal Mick telling us about what is going on there. Michal, please. Thanks, uh, thanks, Turbin. Uh, thanks, everyone. And uh, welcome from Szczecin. My name is Michal Mick. I'm the director of the Center for Economic Analysis, CINEA. Uh, and I'm happy to tell you the, uh, the Polish part of the COVID story. I guess it's, uh, it's uh, fair to say that Poland has succeeded in avoiding an eruption of, uh, of infections. Uh, the Polish government reacted very quickly to the developments abroad. Um, however, uh, as Poland was successful in avoiding the eruption, it was uh, equally unsuccessful in reducing uh, the numbers uh, in similar fashion as we've seen in, in some other countries. The number of daily new infections uh, reported officially is uh, about 400 uh, per day, and it's been stable since basically early April. Poland uh, was one of the first EU countries to restrict non-essential traffic uh, from abroad. Um, all um, foreigners were banned from entering Poland, and all Poles uh, need to uh, go through a 14-day strict uh, quarantine, and that's enforced by, uh, by the government, by the authorities. All air traffic, uh, both internal and external, has been banned, and also in the middle of, uh, of March, schools, universities, and kindergarten, uh, were, kin kindergartens were closed, and uh, they are returning to some activity, but they are still far from the usual uh, opening. Uh, this little chart that you see on this slide shows you the at the bottom the uh, the strictness of the social uh, distancing restrictions that were implemented and they were the heaviest in the first half of April. At that point, uh, there was a ban on public gatherings of more than two people, and this included. Uh, church services. Actually, church services were allowed to, uh, to go with five people um, gathering together. Uh, there was a ban on all non-essential uh, mobility, and the government also banned access to parks, forests, uh, of course, restaurants, bars, and hotels, and uh, institutions like museums, cinemas, as well as gyms were closed. Mm, all uh, children below the age of 18 uh, were banned from leaving their homes on their own. They had to be accompanied by an adult. And of course, in that case, uh, there was only a possibility of one adult going out with another child because there's this ban on, um, on more than two people gathering together. Uh, at some point, the government also introduced the, obliga the obligation of wearing face masks in public. Uh, and this, uh, uh, this restriction is still in place, although it will be lifted on Saturday. As you can see, the, uh, the restrictions have been gradually lifted beginning from about mid-April, and essentially nearly all of them have been, uh, have been lifted by now. 
but these uh, red bars that represent the number of daily infections, as you can see, uh, are still uh, as high as they were in uh, throughout April, essentially. So the, the restrictions are lifted, even though the number of cases uh, is not falling down. It is fair to say, however, that most of the restrictions nowadays are uh, located in one region, in Silesia, about 50% of all cases are in one region, but they keep being reported in all other regions as well. Um, so the, uh, the situation uh, from, from what we can see is still far from being fully under, under control, and yet uh, the restrictions are being lifted. What's uh, peculiar also about all these regulations is the fact that all the limitations have been implemented without a declaration of an official state of emergency. The government instead implemented a, a state of epidemic risk initially and then a state of epidemic. Uh, but the constitution uh, clearly states that you can limit civil liberties, things like public gatherings and pro-public protests only when an official state of, uh, of emergency is declared, and that, uh, that was not the case. We can move to the next, the next slide, please. Um, the government focused, uh, the, government, the government's economic policy focused on two areas. Uh, the first one was protecting jobs. So there's a, uh, several programs uh, focused on the labor market, things like uh, cash transfers to the self-employed and uh, those employed on civil contracts who lost their income. Uh, the government implemented exemptions for social security contributions for three months for small companies and uh, self-employed. And there's several programs of conditional wage support. Uh, and these apply either in cases of uh, stoppage when uh, enterprises had to close and uh, employees could not work in cases where um, the employers decide to reduce hours of work by 20%, and also in specific cases of significant reduction in revenue, and then uh, enterprises can apply to the labor fund for, uh, for support uh, towards their, uh, their employees. Uh, this whole package to, that goes towards the labor market is evaluated at about 1.5% of the GDP. At the same time, the government uh, rolled out several programs related to liquidity support uh, for enterprises. Uh, this included delays of tax payments uh, for the months of March, April, and May, uh, the possibility to deduct uh, the losses of 2020 from the, the next year's tax base, and a range of preferential financing and credit guarantees, both to uh, small and medium-sized companies and to large corporations. Um, there's also a program of subsidies that is specifically focused primarily on smaller and medium-sized companies, but uh, uh, the larger ones can also apply for some, uh, some support. And the subsidies conditional on continued activities and employment will be partly written off uh, in the next years. At the same time, the National Bank of Poland uh, came through with uh, significant uh, cuts in the interest rates from 1.5 first to one and then to 0.5%. And I've just seen in the news that today it uh, took the decision to lower it further to 0.1%. It also reduced the rate of obligatory reserves that the banks need to hold uh, in order to stimulate, uh, stimulate credit. So this is the economic package. Uh, this uh, package was, uh, of course, uh, developed and implemented against uh, a very dynamic background. In Poland, uh, the situation was further complicated by the political um, calendar. Uh, this uh, was due to the presidential election, which had been planned for the 10th of May. Uh, the government was trying to very uh, forcefully, so to speak, to, uh, to go ahead with it. Uh, but in the end, uh, the government had to, had to call it off in a very particular set of circumstances with uh, significant constitutional uh, doubts. Uh, so in a way, the, uh, the election happened, but it didn't happen. We don't know what will, uh, what will follow. The decision as to when to hold the election uh, is expected very soon, but the parliament is now discussing that. 
um, and the constitutional uh, doubts uh, and the legal doubts uh, surrounding these decisions are still still in place. Uh, there are still, of course, these controversies concerning liberty limitations without a formal state of, uh, of emergency. Uh, one uh, uh, announcing the state of emer emergency was the pre precisely the presidential vote, which uh, would have been automatically postponed uh, uh, had the government implemented the state of emergency. Uh, in the debate, there was also uh, a few scandals with the, uh, re related to the privileges of the political elite. Uh, Poland, I guess, is not a, 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 an exception in this case, but uh, that was certainly one of the big uh, points that was debated in, in public. Uh, in terms of the economic policies, very little attention has so far been focused on um, welfare support. Uh, uh, unemployment consequences are still uncertain. Um, the unemployment rate slightly increased in the in the month of April, um, but of course the medium run consequences once the labor market uh, support programs run out is is uncertain. The government has so far not implemented any major welfare support any new welfare support programs so far. What has caused uh, a lot of debate was also the fact that the government has moved on to uh, suggest to propose uh, liberalization of the labor code, which would allow the companies to uh, lay off workers more easily. Uh, this is a very surprising uh, policy at the time when, um, when uh, at the same time the government is, is talking so much about protecting the labor market and, and preserving, uh, preserving the, the, the employment of those who, who already have jobs. In the medium term, uh, I guess I'm not, gonna, I'm not going to say anything original, the medium term the, the outcome will very strongly depend on exports and investment. The Polish economy is very heavily um, dependent on exports to Western Europe uh, and the level of investment uh, in the recent years has been um, surprisingly low if that continues, then uh, Polish economic out, uh, outlook uh, will, not be, will not be very rosy. Uh, but uh, let's hope this uncertainty is limited uh, very soon and, um, and the economy can move on uh, at, a, at a pace that has been going for the last few years. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. We're actually running a little bit against the clock here, but we have Timofey. Milovanov, the president of the Kiev School of Economics. He will be sharing his screen as he talks about Ukraine now. So, Timofey, if you can please try to share your screen with us. Thank you. Right. So, Ukraine uh, has performed about 300 uh, tests and it's running at about 10 to 20,000 tests a day. We have about 40 million population. Mm, therefore, the mm, actual per million people cases are smaller than we are currently in the ranking. Uh, we have about 670 deaths um, as of today. And um, uh, KEC, Kiev School of Economics, uh, is engaged with the government in running models of estimating of different effects of quarantine policies and such. Our estimates that Ukraine will have between 900 and 10,000 deaths by the end of the year, depending on the, um, on the way the virus uh, will behave in the summer. Uh, in the case of no policies, our estimates um, in the worst case scenario um, say that, um, show that we could have had up to 120K uh, people dead by the end of this year had the government not imposed the uh, quarantine policies. But this is, of course, a model and it's debatable. At this point, the model is well calibrated to Ukrainian data. We're considering 81 scenario. Um, we're using the data from the Ministry of Health in terms of ICU capacities, um, uh, capabilities and uh, presence of doctors and such, uh, even the distances uh, to bring people to. So this even a regionally adjusted model. It's predicting the number of deaths so far quite well. Um, it's matching, it's the predictive ability so far of the number of people who are dying is, uh, so the model is well calibrated to it. But, uh, 
um, key health policies. Um, in some ways, Ukraine was uh, harsher than neighboring countries. Uh, Mid-March policies were introduced, um, and then on May 11, the policies were started to become relaxed. Uh, first case was on March 3rd. Very strict quarantine rules, uh, but um, also very strict uh, high, uh, and high fines, but poor inform, um, enforcement. Therefore, um, in the several first several weeks, maybe four to six weeks, there was uh, Mm, there was adherence and compliance with the policy, but after a while, people start getting tired, and the government didn't do much to start punishing people for fining them. Uh, but essentially, we shut down everything. Um, excuse me. Uh, no public transportation at all, except some ground transportation for essential workers. All retail and services were shut down. The only two exceptions were groceries and. Um, uh, pharmaceutical, anything related to pharmaceutical. Uh, schools were kindergartens, government offices, everything was, uh, was shut down. Banks were allowed to operate. Essentially, everyone was sitting do uh, home. Banks were allowed to operate, but mostly it was online. Masks and gloves policies were strict uh, from the very beginning. And they continue to be, uh, to be present right now. Uh, the relaxed rules starting from mid-March were that some public transport, some parks, some services uh, such as hair cutting, for instance, uh, under strict conditions on distancing um, and uh, hygiene disinfection, marketplaces, uh, and I mean markets where farmers sell things now are allowed uh, under some conditions to be open. Um, but that's it. So very harsh rules, uh, but then the government didn't really enforce them and let uh, things... Uh, waiver kind of, uh, you know, get relaxed uh, evolutionary. So the idea here was very strict enforcement in the beginning, very strict quarantine rules, but then not doing much uh, afterwards. That's the approach. You know, whether it's a good approach or a bad approach, we will see in the end. Key economic policies, um, the central bank issued uh, moved almost immediately with macroeconomic and financial stability support packages, mostly uh, putting liquidity in the system and introducing vehicles for long-term refinancing of banks. Also rec uh, relaxing capital requirements, dropping the interest rate uh, substantively in an unexpected move more than the market expect. But the monetary policy continues to remain tight in Ukraine. being at two and three percent, so plus five uh, real interest rate. Uh, we expect it to be dropped even further. Fiscal support packages, the, uh, the budget was uh, reconsidered, reviewed, and the budget deficit was increased from 2% of GDP to about 7 8% of GDP. Intr there were some tax holidays introduced, unemployment and partial employment support, um, and credit uh, interest rates and holidays um, and interest rate compensation for businesses. Uh, a lot of the regulation happened uh, with focus on the labor market. I think that was useful um, because essentially the economy continued to operate in a little bit, you know, better manner than otherwise. So we had an economic uh, growth drop and uh, the first quarter was minus 1.2% of GDP fall year to year compared with Europe on average 2.7, there's some better numbers. The employment, the unemployment numbers went uh, up by 60% uh, and we expect by the end of the year the unemployment to move from 8.5% to maybe 9.2. Some people expect 10%. These are also very good results relative to some neighboring countries. Uh, key policy issues discussed, grant-based uh, support of industry. So they're introducing the government and the parliament introducing, um, they have about 3% uh, of GDP uh, allocated to the coronavirus uh, economic crisis fund. Um, and that fund is used to support industries and they're trying grant-based policies where companies apply essentially, uh, which is not a bad idea. Uh, there is a continuing pressure on the um, central bank to weaken the monetary policy, and they are continuing to do that. Now, there are inconsistencies um, in terms of what we're going to do in real sector. Uh, some of the vested interests are lobbying for different preferential treatment of specific industries. On the international trade, um, 
um, you know, the, uh, we are simultaneously trying to promote export and international trade and uh, introduce import substitution, some protectionism ideas, uh, localization and state procurement. Uh, so there are, the, um, you know, there are inconsistency because at the same time we're trying to trade more and we're trying to trade less. You can, you can say that, you know, we're trying to export more and import less, but it's not quite the story. There are, there are two different groups of ideas fighting. One is that uh, Ukraine should respond by, uh, by becoming a little bit more localized. And the other one is, and in fact, we are trying to use this as an opportunity to, mm, you know, move um, into the global economy and uh, try to be a part of new global chains, which will be appearing maybe take advantage of uh, some production moving to Ukraine. But these are all at the discussion because the capacity of, of the government continues to remain relatively weak. Uh, GDP, we expect the drop in between five to 8%. Inflation is stable at two, 5%, even after the crisis. Um, unemployment will be plus one to 4%, which is uh, uh, not, uh, not critical. Um, salaries continue to grow, by the way an average salary continues to grow in Ukraine during the crisis. Uh, this is interesting, but consistent with what we see in the US. And it might be explained by, um, you know, uh, the fact that it's uh, low uh, skilled workers which are being fired. So you actually have the change in the composition of the workforce. Uh, and from the personal experience, I can say as the president of the Kiev School of Economics, our contingency plan essentially maintains the critical personnel and uh, we are not implementing it, but if we need, we will be firing people, but this is not going to be critical personnel. Critical personnel is better paid, you know, faculty, analysts, uh, top management, these guys will be retained. So this is consistent with this anecdotal evidence. Um, there is a worry uh, that there is some imbalances in real sector. Ukraine has a relatively uh, large state sector, state-owned companies, and um, um, let's say all health services, essentially almost all of them are uh, state-owned, um, similar with education and such. Um, so the ticket is relatively large. And this is where the labor market is inflexible. People are not being fired. And the companies and uh, agencies are becoming, you know, are starting to run, subst accumulate substantive budget deficits. And those, those imbalances can uh, eventually become a burden on the state budget, and that can trigger a financial crisis. So that's under discussion. Uh, nonetheless, financial sector is okay because we have had a staff level agreement with the MF in December. Uh, there have been changes to it. A new staff level agreement has been reached, uh, has been signed last week, and we expect this or the next week the board of directors uh, uh, um, in Washington of the IMF to issue a loan. It's going to be an 18 months uh, standby in the amount of 5 billion, which will be just enough uh, to maintain a disciplined approach to public finance. Political uh, situation is moderately volatile. Moderately volatile means that there are local elections uh, coming up uh, in October. And it appears that the party in power and the president uh, are losing support. Um, this is nothing new, uh, but they are responding to this support and there's some populist pressure and that populist pressure can unravel into undisciplined uh, fiscal behavior, uh, which can trigger a uh, financial crisis so that the crisis from the real sector will push onto the financial system. Uh, and that would, uh, would you know, loop back into the political crisis, which we don't have political crisis right now, but we have a bit of pressure on the president so then that we might end up with that. And then finally, there are some core challenges similar to, you know, the atmosphere I felt from the presentation about Poland, um, that uh, Ukraine didn't really declare a, you know, an emergency state and the number of laws were violated, circumventing or uh, constraining the individual freedoms. This is currently being in our Supreme and Constitutional Courts. Uh, but, uh, you know, so what? The, by the time they consider, the, probably the policies will be relaxed anyway. This is where we are. So, the, you know, I, I would personally evaluate Ukraine's behavior as, a, you know, B minus, you know, or maybe even B uh, positive. Uh, they could have done better had they not been paying too much attention to populist pressures. 
uh, but uh, populist pressures mostly creating imbalances now, which we're not seeing yet, which increase risks for the future, for the fall specifically. But for now, the macroeconomic situation is great. Real sector is down, but is might recover very well, depending on the length of the crisis. Uh, and I should say that Ukraine this time was, uh, you know, in the beginning of the crisis was in a much better condition. Um, international reserves in the central bank were high. We actually do not need the IMF support. We will be able to weather the crisis through. It's more of a political or market expectation management. Uh, and uh, more or less structural reforms are on hold, but they're happening. Uh, and the budget is, again, more or less in, in, in the okay shape. Nothing what we had in 2014 or 2008. Thank you. Thank you, Timofey. Uh, I'm afraid that I have not been uh, an expert in managing uh, the time of this, that I would be able to allow a lot of Q&A coming up here now. Um, but I think this has been a very interesting display of, of the different strategies and policy in this region, and an issue that I think has been a little bit receiving a little bit less coverage than than uh, it deserves. Uh, I will also say to all of you listening still that we will be sharing these slides. We we're going to add a few email addresses in case you would like to get in touch with the speakers uh, on this panel. We also plan to do more targeted uh, presentations from the free network on on the particular issues that these countries are, are facing individually or uh, thematically so so please stay tuned and we will be back with more offers of, of interesting webinars uh, but for now on uh, i would just like to say thank you a lot to all of our panelists in the free network thanks to all of the participants and from stockholm we're wishing you all a great uh, continuation of this day and I hope that your lockdown are, are not too severe so you can enjoy a little bit of sunshine still by the end of the day today. So thank you for this webinar and stay in touch. Uh, bye for today. Thank you.